Good morning. It is Sunday school time again, and we're excited about another lesson out of the book of Luke. Uh, this one is for Sunday, December the 20th of 2020. It's entitled Proclaim, and it's from Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 19. So I want to take just a little bit and look at that with you today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and break those out. We'll be spending all, all this time together in our Bible. Uh, so Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 19, you can get your Bible out. Be ready for that. Just a reminder in chapter 1 of Luke that we've been looking at that records the angelic announcements and the history leading up to that of the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus. Then in chapter 2, which is where our text takes off, it opens up with the birth of Jesus, the good news of that, and also the proclamation and the announce, or the announcement again, the title proclaimed, the proclamation or the announcement to the shepherds. Uh, the emphasis is on God's direct intervention or involvement in the history, but his coming or his advent as we're going through this advent season. And the historians estimate that Jesus' birth actually occurred somewhere between 7 B.C. and 4 B.C., somewhere in that time frame. They're based on those historical events that are recorded in verses 1 through 3 of Luke chapter 2, some very specific events. So they're, they're thinking somewhere in that 7 B.C. to 4 B.C. time frame uh, is what's going on there. And our passage then picks up in verse 4. So let's read together uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 19. I'll read it, and you can follow right along in your Bibles there. It says, So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people today. In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and main, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left, and gone, left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So that's our uh, passage for today as we dig into that the first point of our outline we're looking at today is the promise fulfilled and uh, verses four through seven contain that you might ask well brett what promise are we talking about the promise that the angel gave gabriel told mary and the one that he also told joseph in matthew's gospel that there would be a child born that mary would have a, a son and that it was from the Holy Spirit or by the Holy Spirit. It was the Son of God and, and all those things that we've been looking at uh, earlier. That promise is fulfilled at that point in time. Verse 4 picks up on what was in verses 1 through 3 where it says that they, there was the census that had been declared and that every family had to go to their, their hometown. So it says that Joseph went to his hometown where his family ties were. And even though they were living in Nazareth, his hometown, where he's from, was in Bethlehem. And it says he was the city of David. And a lot of times when we talk about the city of David in the Bible, we're talking about Jerusalem, which was the capital city when David was the king. But in this case, city of David refers to his birthplace, where his family ties were, and that is actually Bethlehem. So that was David's birthplace. Thus it became Jesus' birthplace, which is a fulfillment of prophecy in, in Micah 5, 2, where it said that the Savior, the Messiah, would be born in little town of Bethlehem. So there's that prophecy fulfilled. And it also teaches us in that that Joseph was from the line of David. That's why he had to go there. That's where David's birthplace, Joseph's birthplace, and now Jesus, that he was from the line of David, which is also a fulfillment of prophecy that the Savior, the Messiah, would come from the line of David. Verse 5 
shows us that Mary went with him, that Joseph went to register in his town along with his wife, Mary, who was, in, who was expecting a child. It's not necessarily typical that the wife would go along and, and register, so most likely she was going along just because of the situation that they were in. One, she was pregnant, and he didn't want to leave her at home by herself that close to her pregnancy. But two, again, remember the circumstances. They had been engaged. She came up pregnant before they were actually together and married. The angel spoke to her and spoke to him and said, it's okay, go ahead. But the town's folks may or may not have understood all of that and had all of that message. Uh, so it may have been a little iffy for her to stay home in Nazareth by herself without her husband there to protect her because of what people might think. Regardless of this, what caused her to go along, can you imagine making the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem? It's about 90 miles, by the Bible scholars tell me anyway. I'm not sure of that, but that's what they say. About 90 miles. Can you imagine making that journey on foot or donkey back or whatever that far along in your pregnancy. Imagine the roughness of that journey and what, what that young family was going through there. And then verses 6 and 7 just very simply say, not a lot of uh, build up or anything, just simply says, while they were there, it came time for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn. Just kind of, there it was. That, that's just a matter of fact. I'm sure it's a little bit more dramatic than that in person, but the, as Dr. Luke gives us this, it's kind of just the, the bare facts uh, says that the, she gave birth to her firstborn and not in a nice hospital or with midwives around and all that. It was just Joseph and Mary, as far as we know, and they were in a manger. She gave birth in a feeding trough where the animals stayed because it says there was no room for them in the inn. And we usually think of that as a motel or a hotel, something like that, and that may well have been, but the word that is actually used in the scripture there is not necessarily referring to that. It's more likely to be talking about Many homes in the, those days had the main house, and then they would have a guest room for people who passed by because there weren't a lot of inns and motels and things like that. So hospitality demanded that if someone came by, especially if it was a relative, that you would have a place for them to crash at your place. Uh, and since Joseph was from that area, he probably had kinfolks there. But, you know, if everybody was coming in for the census, he may have gotten there to, at a point where there's no more room at the house. But somebody somehow made a way for them to, to stay out in the area that many homes also had for their animals, a place where they could shelter their animals and feed them. And they did the best they could and found that. And that is where Jesus was born. The Savior of the world was born in a, in a cave or a covered area, hopefully, uh, that just, and in a feeding trough. A very humble, humble beginning for the King of Glory to be born. And then the second point in our outline is verse starts in verse 8. And that is the fulfillment of the promise is announced. And that again, that proclamation, the fulfillment of the promise. The promise was fulfilled in Jesus' birth. Then that fulfillment is then announced to those around. And it says in verse 8 that the shepherds were in the area at, and watching their sheep at night. There are times of the year where the shepherds would bring their sheep to a place to go out to pasture. And they would need to stay up all night with them. And they worked in shifts, and somebody would have to stay up all night to keep the predators and the critters away from attacking and, and destroying the sheep. Uh, and so that's what was going on. These shepherds were there, and they were by. So why, always a good question, is why were the shepherds the first ones to have, to have the announcement? Was it just because they were handy nearby? Probably not, because there was a lot of other people in Bethlehem who were even closer than the shepherds. So why the shepherds? Why did God pick shepherds to receive the announcement first? One thing that's interesting, in that day and time, shepherds weren't way up on the uh, food chain when it came to social ranking. They were kind of at the bottom. That was kind of one of the lower end uh, jobs that you could get. It was kind of looked down upon in that part of the world. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily look down on shepherds because there's a lot of them in the Bible. David, if you'll remember, was a shepherd as a young man before he became king of Israel. But in society at that time, it wasn't looked down. So why do you think God chose shepherds? It is interesting that Jesus referred to himself when he came into his ministry as the good shepherd and that the sheep will know his voice. And many times talked about that concept of shepherding. So that's all interesting how that falls together. But the, the angel of the Lord uh, showed up. And not only did the angel of the Lord show up, it says God's glory went with him. Sometimes when we see angel of the Lord, that is actually the Lord himself. That's the phrase. This seems to be an angel, not the Lord himself. 
But regardless, God's glory came with him, and, and the skies lit up, and the shepherds were terrified. Does that sound familiar? Have we heard people getting an announcement from the angels in our other studies and been terrified? We have. And the angels' response is, don't be afraid, which also sounds familiar. That's exactly what the angel Gabriel told uh, Zacharias, what he told Mary uh, when they when they receive their announcement, don't be afraid. And then the angel gives the announcement. He says, I've got good news. That's what the word gospel means, is good news. I've got gospel for you. I've got good news for you, for great joy. This is going to bring joy, not just to you, but for all people. And that word all is important, because it wasn't just for the Jewish people. It was for all nations and all tribes of all times. Jesus came to be Savior of all. In verses 11 and 12, give that announcement. Here's the good news. Here's the gospel. Here's what the angels are excited about and, and what heaven's excited about, what the shepherds are getting ready to be excited about. It says, today, today, because Mary just had Jesus, today a Savior is born for you. He is the Christ and Lord, or Messiah and Lord. So I want to look for just a second at those three titles. Jesus has many titles and many descriptions uh, of who he is and who he, uh, all of his powers and things. But these are three that we see a lot. The first that says that today is born for you a Savior. It's interesting that the name that the angel told uh, Joseph to give Jesus when he was born is the name Jesus, which means Yahweh is salvation or uh, God is salvation uh, or the salvation or grace of God. So he is our Savior. He's given that name because he is to be the Savior of all people to save them from their sins. So he is a Savior, which we need. It also says he is the Christ or the Messiah. Christ is the Greek version of that. Uh, the one that the, the anointed one that the Jews have been waiting on seemingly forever that would come and bring Israel to, to, to full knowledge of who God was. And, back. and in their minds, he was going to come and be a conquering uh, hero on earth and wipe out all the bad people. In this case, would be uh, the Romans wipe out all the bad folks and put Israel back on top. That's not exactly what God had in mind, as we know, as a spiritual uh, savior and a spiritual anointed one. But but He is the Messiah, the Christ. And the third title is the title Lord, and that word means master or the one who is an authority. So this this is who Jesus is. That's why it's good news that today is born one who will save us one who is the anointed one that will usher in the kingdom of God like it's supposed to be to bring us back into relationship with God and that he is Lord, he is, has authority over our lives. It says, and you will, the angel said, and you will find him in a manger. And I can just imagine shepherds are already messed up anyway because the angel shows up and the glory of the Lord shows up and they're terrified and then they get this announcement and it's all, this is who's coming, it's this glorious king and you're going to find him in a, in a manger wrapped in just plain old cloths, plain old, just something they found laying around. And they probably went, huh? How is it that this Savior Messiah Christ is going to be in a, in a feeding trough in somebody's backyard? That doesn't make sense. But that's what the word was. And then the angel called together some other angels, and they had a little choir meeting, and the worship breaks out, and they begin to proclaim glory to God in the highest and peace on earth goodwill towards men or God's favor rest on men. And that peace on earth, many times we think that means that we're going to get along with each other. You know, that there, we're, we're just, God comes and then everybody just magically gets along. That's not exactly what it was talking about. It was meaning peace between God and man. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do and to be. Was that reconciliation between lost sinners and holy God. Jesus brought peace between God and man. He was the justifier to make it, make us be able to be right with God but by his sacrifice, which is farther down in his life. It's the purpose for which he came. So that was the announcement. So the third point is now what? The third point of our outline today is now what? Verses 15 through 19. The shepherds got this message. Now what? What are they going to do with that? Do they just go back to watching sheep? Woo! That was great. Oh, Okay, well, I guess the angels are gone. Uh, we still got sheep to watch. We'll just keep watching sheep. Or maybe they're just going to keep all that to themselves. You know, people are going to think we're crazy if we tell them that the angel of the Lord appeared and there was angels shouting praise and there's a baby in a manger that's the same. Uh, we're not going to tell anybody that. They're going to think we've lost our mind. 
Maybe they just forget it and keep on going through life like they normally do. So what did they do? In verse 15 it says their decision was seemingly pretty quickly, let's go and see this thing that's been told us. They said, that sounds awesome and unbelievable and marvelous and miraculous. Let's go see it for ourselves. And they do that. They take off and they, they go right then. They leave the sheep, seemingly. You know, I guess, you know, if the Lord says go see it, go see it. So he'll take care of the sheep. But they left them. And it says in verse 16, they found Mary and they found Joseph and they found the baby lying in the manger just like the angel said. And then verse 17 through 19 really kind of gets to the heart of it. It says, and then they reported what they had seen and they had heard. They told that good news, that gospel, the, that there's joy to the world, there's peace for earth, on earth for men, that there's a, a, there's a good thing that happened today. Everybody that would listen to them, they went and told that. After they'd seen Mary and Joseph and the baby and, and had that time to spend and, and see it for themselves, they went out telling everybody, and everyone who heard that message was amazed was amazed at what they had heard because it was good news and it was amazing and it was the glory of God there so all that great story and this you know good thing to read at Christmas time you know is, is that this is how Jesus came and the announcement to the shepherds but what are we supposed to do with that besides just feel warm and fuzzy on the inside what are we supposed to do with that what what should we do with this the passage should cause us to ask this question how should I respond how should I personally respond to this message? This is what the shepherds did. How should I respond to the message? Mary and Joseph, when they got the message that this was going to happen, they followed God's call. They followed God's call regardless. A 90-mile trip on donkey back or on foot while you're however many months pregnant, but that's what God called them to do. To take the scorn of the people around you because you were pregnant outside of the, the marriage relationship, because God had come upon you by his Holy Spirit, they were willing to do that. They Take Mary as your wife, even though all this is going, they were willing to do that. Mary and Joseph responded to God's call by doing what God called them to do, regardless of what it cost. The angels just worship. They celebrate. This is good news. And they began calling out to God, and worship broke out. The shepherds, when they heard it, they wanted to go experience it for themselves. They didn't want to just hear about it. They wanted up close and personal to have that kind of encounter with God and, and God's gospel, his good news. And once they did hear it, then they told everyone, anyone and everyone who would listen to them, they told them, and those folks were amazed. So the takeaway for me out of all this is we need to be careful that the good news, the gospel, doesn't grow old in our lives, that it doesn't get old, that it doesn't say, yeah, 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 I know that story. What's it mean for me today? Yes, Jesus came, but how am I responding to that? To, am I following God's call in my life? Am I doing whatever God asked me to do regardless of the cost? Am I worship and worshiping and celebrating Jesus, that he is my Savior, that he's my Lord, he dwells within me through Holy Spirit? Am I daily worshiping and celebrating that? Do I live in the joy of God has come? that he is here, that he is with us, he is Emmanuel. Am I celebrating that in my daily life? Am I experiencing him? Like the shepherd said, let's go see this thing. Am I experiencing God close up? Is it a personal relationship? Or am I doing a list of do's and don'ts or oughts and shoulds? Am I doing that instead of experiencing God one-on-one, -on -one, up close, personal, feeling his presence, sharing my heart with him? Am I seeing him up close and personal? And finally, am I telling people the good news am i telling everyone that will listen about this good news this jesus who came this savior who was born am i excited enough about what jesus has done in my life is doing in my life will do in their lives that i'm going to tell others about that that's god's calling us the, for the gospel the good news the announcement of the birth of jesus that it would be proclaimed as the title says that we daily proclaim it we go to get a hold of it personally, and then we tell others about it. That's God's call in our life. And I hope that I will, and I hope that you will do that. Tell everyone you can about the good news of Jesus. Don't let the gospel get old in your life. Let's pray together, then you have the rest of Sunday to do what you need to do. Glorious Father, how marvelous you are. What a beautiful, beautiful gift you have given us through Jesus. And I thank you that we can tell that story. And it never needs to grow old for us. That, that you loved us so much that you gave your son. 
that if we would believe in him, we would not perish, but have everlasting life. That, Father, you sent him as a babe in a manger, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross for our sins, and he sits at your right hand right now as he was resurrected uh, to not only get victory over sin, but over death as well. And that, God, we can live in that victory. So, God, today let us rejoice. Let us celebrate. Let's, let us encounter the living Christ in our lives. We ask it in his name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday afternoon.